I'm ready. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenna Fender, and I'm here today with Sandy Rogers, and she is, amongst many things, the author of Novice and Beyond, a Survival Guide, a column in Clean Run Magazine. And since this is our back to training party, we're going to talk about training contacts, specifically why maybe even though you've been running in trials all summer, why your contacts may not be the same as they were when you started the summer, and um, and what you could do about that. So, hi, Sandy. Thanks for being good here. Good morning, Brenna. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Good to see you, too. <laughs> All right. So, why, um, why do my contact performances change over time? Um, it's a, it's, it is the $100,000 question. <laughs> so, there's two reasons. One, lots of folks show before their contact behaviors are trained well enough. Okay. So there's three things that go wrong. The dog either stops early on the contact. The dog either doesn't stop at all. I'm talking about a two on, two off training right. position specifically. Mm -hmm. um, or the dog does stop, but he releases himself. So those are three separate training holes. There's three separate things that are lacking in the training program. But what I want to talk about today mm -hmm. is the ever popular subject of what about those people that train their contacts really super well? Okay. He really did do the homework. The dog is trained and he goes into novice and he's doing real, real good. And then that behavior disintegrates and everybody seems so surprised by that. Right. I think that um, in the very nature of sequence work and course handling, everybody's contacts are going to disintegrate, even mine. <laughs> It was uh, last summer we were at a show with my uh, fellow trainers and all three of us pretty thinking we're pretty good dog trainers contacts. We all miss contacts that one day. So I said, I got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing now is uh, I train my contacts just like I did when I first taught them in baby step, what I call back to kindergarten training sessions. And I also, um, when I'm handling and sequence and uh, coursework, I handle for real. That means quick releases. So even in training, you're doing quick releases. When I'm handling sequences, okay. I'm handling as if I'm at the dog show. Okay. And that was something I didn't do for decades. No. I always handled, I always reinforced contacts in sequence work. Thinking you're right. My dog might believe that in sequence work, he's going to get reinforced. Mm -hmm. Well, dogs are sometimes a little smarter than we give them credit for. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Those two environments get pretty easy to distinguish between. Mm -hmm. So um, what I do now is I, uh, I do drills with quick releases because I think the adrenaline factor mm -hmm. is what disintegrates, one of the things that disintegrates the behavior. If we're re going in and physically reinforcing in sequence work all the time, all that adrenaline is getting a break. Mm -hmm. We go in and we feed, oh, yeah. and then we go back, and we go in and we feed. In competition, there's no adrenal adrenaline break. Right. Both the dog and the handler have all this adrenaline going through the whole thing, and it's difficult for us and the dog to do our jobs with no adrenaline break. So how do we fix it? <clears throat> we train like we trial, for one, like you're talking about. Yeah. Um, what if we already have a problem? What if my dog you is... Go back and plug your holes, whether that uh -huh. hole is based on the dog not knowing where to put his feet, meaning he's stopping early, mm -hmm. whether the dog doesn't understand his release word, which means he stops and releases on his own, okay. or whether the dog isn't stopping at all. And some dogs that aren't stopping at all, they've just done too much stationary work that, where the dog is put on the contact, held, reinforced a bunch, and then released. That's all about a sit stay. That the contact work is really just a glorified sit stay. And mm -hmm. most folks that come to me with problems, I can tr trick the dog on a stand stay. I think we don't teach stand stay enough. We teach sit stay and down stay, but um, the stand stay is what the contact is. So a rock solid stand stay with a spring release. Mm -hmm. So I go back and bake all that. Better work on that. But then I do figure eight drills on each of the contacts. What I mean by that is I take like the A-frame and I put a jump at each end and I just go back and forth and back and forth and do quick releases. But I have to make sure that that second paw has touched the ground for at least an instant. Mm -hmm. Now, if I do a bunch of that, Brenna, my dog is going to start thinking that his second footfall is the release itself. Okay. 
and I don't want that. Right. Once I get that, then I've got something to work with. Because what the dog started feeling was the adrenaline, mm -hmm. and I can release myself. And now I've tapped into a fundamental misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Then I can teach. That's the exciting part. I'm not afraid of mistakes. Right. So you're really almost pushing them to make the uh, the mistake, and then in a, in a practice, and then you're you're working on then how to teach that almost fundamental misunderstanding that you then have. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm doing is to see if I can get a full two on two off for a split second, mm -hmm. over and over and over, without them determining that when they stop for a split second, they can right. then go. So I will. I will reward a final stick. So say I do four quick releases, not early. Mm -hmm. right. Early release is when the dog still has any paw on the contact obstacle. Okay. So I'm making sure. And some of my students will start to release as the second paw is touching the ground. I'm looking at my paws here. <laughs> <laughs> and and then the dog will really start to make the mistake that we don't want to make, which is when that second paw touches and just grazes the ground. I'm wanting a full stop. I'm wanting that second paw and that bit of a rock back. And then I'm going to release. And I'm going to do each of the contact obstacles in the same way. If the dog struggles, I need to go back to fundamentals, back to my kindergarten program of testing, which is a longer stick. Mm -hmm. The other thing, Brenda, that I'm doing is I'm releasing off of, I'm rewarding off of the contact. Okay. So I've got that reinforcer planted or I throw it. Okay. Because I also feel that when the handler comes in after the initial stages of training, during sequence work, for example, I believe that we're making our position next to the dog by reinforcing in that manner more relevant than we want. I want my dogs to believe that my position isn't relevant. Right. But every time he's eating with me right there next to him, I believe I'm making my position more relevant than I want to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. So now if your dog is toy motivated, then you're throwing or planting a toy. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I need a dog that understands his stay job off of the contact obstacle with that reinforcer planted. So I want, I love balls that have um, a handle on them for the oh, dogs yeah. that are crazy yeah, about like this balls. One. <laughs> this has a bungee and some fur and a ball. So fur. that's cool because mm -hmm. if I've got a dog that's motivated by fur and right. balls, I've got a double whammy or either or. The ball will, will stay put and land nicely. But I could use a soft toy. Mm -hmm. Some dogs aren't into balls. They want something super, you got right. something super soft there. Right, I do. Yes, I have lots of soft um, toys. That... So even a soft tuggy that can't be thrown right. can be planted. Right. So you could throw some of these. Like this one's really got a lot of heft to it, so you could it, you could throw does, that. And that could be planted. Mm -hmm. That might be hard to hide on your body. So right. Something smaller. Mm -hmm. um, or a treat and train. Having a treat and train out there. Right now, that would be for your more food. That's if you're thinking about using food. I'm sorry. Brenda. Yeah, sorry. That's if you're thinking about using food. If you're you're moving toward the more food motivated dogs, you're going to talk about putting the the treat and train out. Or a lot lotus ball. Right. Oh, oh, I have one of those. Yep. Lotus ball. So you put the food inside. The food can be there and the dog can run to it. This is nice because it's, this is a, um, a larger sized one. There's a smaller size too that you could stick maybe in your pocket a little bit more, but you could throw this and, and have some belief that it's going to go where you threw it. Not like it's going to just float or whatever. So. You can, th you can throw those or plant them. Plant them. Yeah. That's a big what advantage with that. And planting, I just mean that the toy is already out there. Right. So getting the dog to run towards reinforcement as well as stop, mm -hmm. that's a training challenge that needs to be met offside of the contact obstacle. Right, because I then... Like to use, I like to use a little short travel board. Okay. A little short uh, mm -hmm. contact travel board. So that's a training project in itself. Right. The one thing I want to mention, Brenna, is if your dog makes a mistake and drives and steals the reinforcement when you didn't want him to, right. 
that's on the handler. Mm -hmm. If your dog does that, he just doesn't understand. And I would be really careful about correcting a dog for driving to reinforcement, even if it was when you didn't want him right. to, because he just didn't understand. And if you dampen that magic, that's yeah, magic. Mean. Drive to reinforcement. Getting the stop on the way is on. That's a that's the handler's training. Mm -hmm. responsibility right so I don't if they steal the toy I just take them off of it take it off of them and I don't ever ever scold them for driving to reinforcement right I need that magic and then you just know what you need to go back and work on which is steady your stays really yes mm -hmm. yep Understand. it all comes back to foundation stuff it does, <laughs> it does. But, I, but I do believe the training without the adrenaline breaks getting those dogs to do that two on two off and release and that figure eight drill that I was talking about that's just one piece of the puzzle if I did that all the time I would definitely teach a dog to self-release right and I also do giant loops of contacts mm -hmm. so I'll have the a-frame the dog walk and the teeter in a big circle with jumps in between them and do speed circles of mm -hmm. quick releases and then every third or fourth I'll release off of the contact to a juicy wonderful ball, soft tug, treat and train, um, reward. All right. Now one more question before we wrap it up. And that is, um, are you continuing to do these exercises with your dogs all throughout their careers or is Absolutely. this, okay. So this is a continuing maintenance. I do I speed circle quick releases with all my students, all my dogs at least once a week. Oh wow. Once a week. All right. Yep. Good back to school work then. Get in school. Get back to school and stay in school with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brenna. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>